central banks have to stay the course. Stay put, interest rates are high, they will stay high for longer, but we are expecting 24, early 2025, 20, the picture to change. Inflation is uh, the enemy of the economy, and that will take a long time, uh, in my forecast, until it reaches the central bank's uh, target, uh, target level. So I do believe that we can deal with the challenge of maintaining economic growth and controlling inflation. The bottlenecks are on the supply side, and any types of long-term investment is going to lead to reducing these supply bottlenecks, including avoiding excessive decoupling, excessive fragmentation, excessive uh, balkanization of the global economy is going to be important. We operate the digital economy. The digital economy kept us going while we were all locked in at home. That is resilience. You know, that is an aspect that helped. But I think there are learnings over the last three years on how resilient we need to be for the next unexpected thing that will happen. We don't see enough efforts from the international community to take proper measures, to encourage consultations, to encourage peace talks. Who needs to make the big move to drive some kind of a peace bargain? I think everybody. Both sides. This is, is about as clear a case of right versus wrong as I think we've seen in our lifetime. But also because the Ukrainians are going to fight on. The Ukrainians are determined to retake their country. We are not against doing business with anybody. But we do not. We believe that our diplomatic relations should stay firmly with Taiwan. But through Mercosur, we can do business with, with anybody in the world. In the, in the darkest hours. Breaking Full news tonight. Russian Ukraine is under attack by land, Tens sea, of thousands of people have been killed. <laughs> Humanity prevails. In our deepest despair. We need help. Life finds a way. With the fierce fighting in Sudan, hundreds have died, millions remain caught in the conflict. Our systems are fractured. People are really having to choose now between heating and eating. The biggest bank failure since the 2008 financial what crisis. What is going on then at SVB? Our planet is weeping. 193 million people around the world experience acute food insecurity. It's time to act. We need change. We need change. To innovate. Three, two, one. Collaborate. And we will be there to support you till the end. And celebrate. It represents so much. Let's explore solutions together. This is the Qatar Economic Forum, powered by Bloomberg. Please welcome to the stage has Linda Amin, host and editor-at-large of the Qatar Economic Forum, powered by Bloomberg. Welcome to the third and final day of the Qatar Economic Forum. We really appreciate you being here. Well, yesterday you had a front row seat to conversations with government leaders spanning from Latin America to South Asia, as well as pioneering tech founders and investors and CEOs at the center of art, luxury, as well as cinema. Now, for our last day, we'll cover a wide range of topics from cryptocurrencies, everybody's favorite topic, the future of food, the road to a greener future, and future of commodities. But before we begin, just a couple of announcements. We'd like to thank our official partners, Ministry of Commerce and Industry and Media City Qatar, our presenting sponsors, Qatar Investment Authority, QNB and QRDI Council, and our participating sponsor, QInvest. The Wi-Fi network, 
By the way, you know this already, right? Qatar Economic Forum, the password is Bloomberg. Would love to hear from you. If you want to ask any questions to any of our speakers, respond to our polling questions, just scan the QR code on the back of your badge. You can also engage with us on social media. Of course, it is Qatar Economic Forum. That is the hashtag. Now, let's get the third day started. And we shift our attention to where I come from, Southeast Asia, to one of the region's powerhouses. Amid a global slowdown, how can Malaysia further diversify its export-oriented economy? Please join me in welcoming to the stage His Excellency Mohammad Rafizi Ramli, Minister of Economy for Malaysia. Now, the world is expecting an economic slowdown, but Malaysia is an outlier. It's looking to exceed expectations, achieve growth of about 4.5%, which, by the way, would make it the fastest growth for the country in about two decades. It has been struggling somewhat. So what's driving this optimism? Let's get perspective from the minister himself. Minister, good to have you with us. Thank you very much. What's driving the optimism? I mean, this is a trade-reliant nation. The world is slowing, and Malaysia is expected to achieve better than expected growth. How? We've benefited over the years from a very diversified economy. We, we have the commodities, and we are the second largest um, uh, palm oil producer in the world. Um, we've built uh, a resilient manufacturing base economy which is very export-oriented, especially in chips and semiconductors. And we also benefited from uh, the energy prices because um, we have um, uh, a long-standing um, relationship with customers in, in the Far East, but we're also an uh, oil-producing nation. So we are cautiously optimistic. But, but fundamentals have not changed. In fact, there are more headwinds now. Yeah. What's different? It's, um, I think it's uh, given, um, of course, the, the uh, post-pandemic recovery is one thing, but I think there's also optimism because for the first time in, in a generation, uh, we have a supermajority government. So we have had a political transition in the last five years. Um, so there's a lot of excitement that key structural reforms to bring us up to cross the high-income nation status. Uh, we are expected to, to achieve that between 2026 and 2028. So these two years is key to us to roll out structural reforms fiscally, in terms of the mix of the economy, in terms of the energy transition. So I think there's, there's a lot of focus and excitement looking into Malaysia because of this um, crucial time. It's great to have the excitement and the plan, but the challenge is implementation. You said before that you want to accelerate restructuring. How and which sectors in particular, and what time frame are we looking at? We understand enough that we have to be very um, sector-focused. Um, in the last six months since taking office, we've focused on energy transition. So we've, we've made few... Um, key policy changes. Um, that includes, for example, in the next few months, Malaysia will launch um, a regional renewable energy exchange market that will facilitate and accelerate cross-border um, renewable trade. Because we have this unique situation where Malaysia is geographically very central to the whole region, and you have the uh, mainland in the north, with a lot of RE potentials, but there's a lot of demand as well in terms of RE in Malaysia, in Singapore, and uh, Malaysia is well positioned to connect the whole region. Um, and um, because of that, I think um, some key uh, decisions had to be made. And, and the policy of the past was to develop organically for our market first, so that we, 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 we build the capacity domestically before we think about trade. But we've, we've taken that very bold step to lead the way towards a, a regional um, 
energy um, exchange in, in the region. So I think because of that, as, as I say, uh, we will have to scale up our capacity by about 11 times in the next 20 years. And for that to happen, we have to invest about $150 billion in infrastructure in the next 20 years. So all this with very focused on um, energy transition, I think it bodes well to the region as well as to investors, as well as to scale up our transition from medium value manufacturing to high value uh, leadership in energy. Might funding be an issue? I, so far, we've had a few um, early takers um, in terms of interest. I, I think um, uh, South Asia remains uh, one of the fastest growing um, region in the world. Uh, it's also geographically in between two large economies. And I, I, we are at the um, stage where we are able to transition um, better. And because of that, I think um, the, the, the interest um, has always been there. Uh, it's just about the scaling up of the capacity. Mm. And South Asia, especially Malaysia, has been the home for a lot of MNCs in semiconductors, in assembly. Um, and all of us are very committed to net zero um, commitment by 2050. So when we de-bottleneck, starting from policy and regulations, to facilitating the market, to diverting national resources and allocations towards infrastructure, I think that's where the interest has been pouring so far. As you said, energy is a key sector. Oil, it is an oil-producing country, but it's also a country where there's tremendous oil subsidies mm. and some of those subsidies are going to people who don't even need it. How are you looking at subsidies? What's the outlook? We, I, I know in the past, um, successive administrations in Malaysia has always looked at subsidy retargeting as a great political cost because Malaysia is a heavily subsidized um, society when it comes to energy. We have blanket energy subsidies for diesel, for uh, petrol for electricity, um, and that has been a litmus test um, for previous administrations. In the last six months, we've rolled out a subsidy retargeting program. Um, we divide it into three chunks. We um, transition from a blanket subsidy system to a uh, means tested. For electricity, for example, is based on um, energy consumption. Um, it's, it's, it's a painful process we have to go through because we, have, we had removed uh, energy subsidies for um, industries. Mm. So industries have to pay market price now. The next step is to remove to domestic users with very high energy usage. And by the end of the year, we would have saved, I think, about 15% of the annual subsidy bill that um, took up 25% of uh, national operating budget every year. So the saving would have gone to uh, social safety net. Uh, saving would also would have gone to um, building infrastructure, especially in sectors and areas that we want to develop further, renewables, uh, digital, semiconductors, and so on. You keep talking about semiconductors. I think a lot of people don't realize that Malaysia produces a lot of the chips, in fact, 30% of the back end. Um, what is the strategy to capitalize on the opportunities given that semiconductors are the focus of the world right now? Uh, Malaysia has had semiconductor industry since the 70s. It's just that the global value chain of semiconductors dissect different countries for different parts of the value chain. Um, we contribute about 30% of the assembly, testing and packaging of chips. Um, but there is an opportunity now that um, we diversify. We are looking at um, um, also fabrication. And I think there are opportunities given the presence of all the big names of, of semiconductors of the world in Malaysia. And the demand for semiconductors will continue to grow. I mean, people talk about generative AI. And the consequence of that is definitely 
a demand for better chips, faster chips in the future. And we are at the stage where our workforce is positioned and groomed to move and diversify from the mid-level value chain of packaging and testing. How so? I mean, when you talk about the workforce that is groomed and being skilled mm -hmm. to perform those tasks, I mean, give us a sense of what is being done because there has been a shortage, there mm. continues to be a shortage, yeah. and even countries like Singapore, which has been in the business for a very long time, is having issues. The policies of the past was very much um, supply-driven. That means we built our universities and technical colleges, we built a national curriculum, and it has worked for about 30 years. But the pace of technology has picked up, and, uh, and, and we, we are shifting uh, towards a demand driven by um, giving the freedom and incentives and working with industries so that industries are given the skill to train very quickly more on um, taking the approach of on-the-job training, moving away from a, a national certification, more towards taking people and training them in the industry. So we've, we've run a pilot test. Um, we're going to scale it up. And we're going to replicate the same for other industries as well. So manufacturing is one. Uh, that means uh, national incentives and investment incentives will have to move away from purely tax and fiscal incentives more towards upskilling and training incentive for manufacturers. And this, this, I think, will be received very well and will allow us to scale up training and preparation of the workforce um, at much faster speed. And we are looking at national bootcamp. We have a shortage, just like any countries in the world, for coders, software engineers, data analysts. Um, and we've realized that you don't need to go to universities for four years to do that. People can do this constantly in chunk size training and bootcamp. And um, some people do this um, you know, virtually. Um, it has been happening all over the place in the last few years. But now the government is pumping resources to scale it up at the national scale. And I think that will um, complement whatever we have um, through our training institutions. Does and it mean that other states beyond Penang will be possible centers as well? Yes, yes. Um, um, of course, you know... Ten years down the road, I mean, how is it going to look like? Give us a sense of the vision for Malaysia. We do have existing infrastructure in certain parts of the countries for certain industries. So semiconductors has been in the north for a long time, based in Penang. Um, obviously, it will grow organically, and uh, I can understand um, when um, investments come. Obviously, naturally, they will gravitate towards where the industry has been. But given uh, um, our focus to diversify, there are various activities and uh, um, investments uh, that can be spread across the country. And we are looking, for example, at the central region on the more high-end R&D um, um, uh, data centers. Um, we are looking at um, the south, for example, to focus not just on the traditional oil and gas and new fuel, but also uh, on renewables. Uh, and I think, um, with massive investments, both from the private and, and government sector, we will be able to balance uh, the focus between the regions. Minister, I'd like your views on the trends in the world today. There's a lot of talk about decoupling, deglobalization, some say re-globalization, onshoring, friendshoring. Where are we in this conversation and where do you see Malaysia fitting in? Malaysia has always been a trading nation. And one of um, our strengths in the past is the uniqueness of our society. It's a very multiracial society. Uh, and um, we have cultural and historical connections with all the major parts of the economies of the world. Um, we, we, we have a very much westernized education system and administrative system. Um, we have very close ties with the Muslim world. We have um, a significant Chinese population that, that um, uh, works very well 
with our focus with China market, we also have significant Indian population that connects us to India. And being part of Southeast Asia, we are part of that um, 600 million market. And I think going forward, we want to play uh, to our strength and uh, continue to work collaboratively. Uh, and the next focus for us, of course, um, are new uh, growth regions. And, and that's why part of the reasons I think uh, Malaysia has always participated um, at the highest level um, at this forum. And um, I think the partnership is important for the future. And uh, if we uh, develop um, right partnerships and playing to our strength and our partner's strength, and that will allow us to um, co-write to new markets and new industries and new focus sectors. But how much stretch, how much pressure are you feeling from the tension between the US and China? Uh, Southeast Asian nations have often said they don't want to be asked to choose sides, and rightly so. But how much pressure are you feeling? We were built over the years through friendships with, you know, often um, conflicting uh, geopolitical tensions around the world. And we have been able to work um, with the US, with China, with any blocs in the last 50 years. And, and that is a testimony of how we have grown and we provided value to all in that sense. So I think um, it's a skill that we've picked up <laughs> along the way and I think we will maintain that skill um, and we always believe that so long as we offer the value uh, and so long we offer access to that big market of Southeast Asia and so long we um, continue to grow, um, I think we are the right partners for everyone. It's a new government, six months old. Is it stable? Will it be able to push through the reforms and the plans that the government has right now? It's, um, it's a grand national unity government, and because of that, we have a two-third majority that allows us to amend constitution. We've not seen this in a generation. Um, but how stable, that is the question. Well, I, 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 I think we will last the full term, as opposed to the previous three administrations. Um, and I think there's also a yearning um, uh, with Malaysians that we want to march forward. We've gone through that political transition. There was a change of one-party rule for the first time in 2018. It took some time to settle down. The dust has settled. Um, the onus is for us to leverage and take the opportunity of this super majority and stability to push through the reforms. And that's why the timing of the decisions are very important because we've, we've seen in previous um, governments um, and, and, you know, democratic tenure has its uh, shelf life as well. We notice that if key structural reforms are not made in the first year of taking office, usually it will be reversed or it will be put on the back burner because by the second year you are in office, you'll be thinking about <laughs> general elections in two years' time. So it's very important for us to um, phase in uh, reforms one after another. The trick is to balance between consistent policy changes with the need to uh, not to rot the boat too much because just like any countries in the world, we are facing um, high expectation from society. Society is grappling with inflation, with disparity in wages. And, and that's the focus that has been taken by this government, that the structural reforms goes in uh, chunk size, uh, month after month, and it will provide for that strong foundation, and uh, we hope the result will speak by itself. The thing is, if you speak to the investment community, the corporates, there's a sense of urgency. They say Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim had a long time to think about policies, and yeah. now that he is in power, he needs to put those policies in place in a hurry. Mm. We talk about sustainability, and just like energy transition, just like the economy, political sustainability is also important. And I think that's why balancing between the list of reforms and what needs to be done with 
um, managing the expectations and, and um, getting the overall ecosystem to be on board and on the same page is important. And I think one year is, is not a long time. We've done uh, a major reform on subsidy in the first six months. Um, the pace of policy change will pick up uh, from the second half of the year because we are, we, we are phasing everything to build up towards uh, the budget announcements in, in November. So we'll launch a, mass, uh, a new industrial master plan in August. We will have uh, a revision of five-year planning in September. And I think there will be more clarity on month-to-month -month basis because what we want to avoid as well is going with a big bank, with a list of things that we intend to do, and uh, six months down the line, disappoint everyone with the pace of implementation. So balancing between what we intend to do with how we do it, I think is, is, is that's key to making it sustainable. Minister, just one final question as we wrap up. We opened up the discussion uh, talking about growth. We're looking at about four and a half. Is there a sense that you could get to five this year? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually cautiously optimistic. I think we will be able to cross five, even if we don't cross, it's, it's on the high end of the four. The trick is to make sure that we divert national allocations away from subsidies and put more into infrastructure projects because we would like to use this so-called down cycle, you know, a, a slowing down of global economy to do all the investments and uh, refocusing of our economy so that when it does pick up, we are in a position to really benefit. So, of course, government then has to reprioritize. Um, I think in the next one or two years, we can see uh, a better than expectation growth if government can um, push up public spending as well as um, long-term investments in the high growth sectors that we want to focus in. An upbeat assessment of the economy. Minister, thank you so much for your time thank today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Peter Smith, co-founder and CEO of Blockchain.com for a conversation with Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabazaja. Hey Peter, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, Peter just landed here this morning, so <laughs> we're very grateful. That, that you came here. L listen, Peter, I mean, there, there's, there's no shortage of things to talk about when, when it comes to crypto and blockchain, but when we think about 2022, I, I, I want to start there because there was a series of implosions, I don't know how you would describe it, uh, uh, missteps, crypto plummeted, lots of mistrust in, in the industry as a whole. How would you characterize 2023 for the industry about five months in, I guess we should say? Yeah, so I think... Uh 2023 has been largely pretty positive for the industry. So if you look at sort of year-to-date returns, uh, the digital asset class would be the strongest performing asset class in financial markets. It's up about 45% on the year so far. But it's probably worth talking about 2022 briefly. You know, in crypto, we have an incredibly cyclical market. So there's about a four-year cycle in crypto. Part of the reason it's so cyclical is it's still a very small market. So if you total up all the major cryptocurrencies in existence today, they're worth about 0.6 of Apple. So it's still a very small market, and you're going to have a lot of volatility and cyclicality within that market. What was a little unusual about 2022, which you know, sort of our models suggested would be a correction year, and it certainly was a huge correction year, is that we had a lot of counterparty failures. We had a lot of sort of failure of companies inside of the crypto space. And you know, one of the most notable is certainly FTX. I think that you know, it was a little bit crypto's version of the great financial crisis. Um, but it turns out when you don't have the Fed to backstop, it's going to be a lot more violent. right? There's no overnight window in crypto. You can't go put your illiquid assets somewhere and borrow liquid against it. You are totally on your own. 
And that means that really only the absolutely strongest players survive. Mm. So if you look at like the 12 most valuable companies in crypto uh, a year and a half ago, uh, there's only four of us left. Mm. Uh, and so only the absolute strongest survive. But I think for trying to build a system that is native to the internet, that is sort of beyond any one country, that is beyond any one central bank, mm -hmm. it's actually really healthy for those firms that are not prepared to be resilient in that fashion to fail. Um, and there's a little bit of self-interest there because you know I have eight less competitors now, uh, but um, I think it's still really healthy to have these sort of like cleansing periods through the market. Um, that said, you know, it was a very, it was a very wild year. Yeah, wild, tumultuous, and uh, as I was mentioning, there's a lot of trust that was lost uh, given that. So then, uh, how well, do you? I, I think there was trust that was lost, but there was also trust that was gained. So, for example, we had had one of our biggest issues in our institutional business, or one of the largest prime brokers in the world, is that our onboarding process was a lot more difficult because we operate out of entirely regulated entities with like very real regulators like Moss or New York. And so it's very, it's very intense. Mm -hmm. And so our onboarding is a lot harder than sort of offshore unregulated players, mm -hmm. right? We would lose clients to those folks. Mm -hmm. Over the last six, seven months, we've seen a huge surge in onboarding mm -hmm. because people want to be trading opposite a regulated, trusted institution that was able to survive the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. So a lot of trust was lost. A lot of trust was also gained. So for us over the last year, we've seen a net client inflow mm -hmm. on both a number of clients' basis as well as an AUM basis. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's a bit nuanced. Where are you seeing the most growth in terms of clients? Right now, the most growth that we're seeing on the consumer side mm -hmm. is in sort of rest of world markets. So I was sharing backstage you know, we're growing very quickly in Nigeria, Ghana, Colombia, Argentina. Um, we also grew a lot in Ukraine because we made our service entirely free in Ukraine. Um, and so we've seen a lot of growth in these markets, which is predominantly driven by stablecoin usage. Mm -hmm. It's much more driven by stablecoin usage than it is driven by, you know, sort of purchasing, selling, investing in cryptocurrencies. And then on the institutional side, most of the growth we're seeing is largely driven by consolidation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of competitors having gone under, there's less places to trade, there's less places to onboard, and so we're seeing a lot of growth that's driven more by consolidation than anything else. On the institutional side, though, you mentioned that you, you and your team had to, to shut down your institutional, the wing of your institutional business. I, I, can you... Oh, no. No, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. We, we are very active in the institutional market today. Oh. Um, you know, we probably have traded with at least uh, three or four clients since you and I sat down. Um, so the institutional business is incredibly active today and has picked up a lot of market share over the last six to 12 months. What about going forward? Because it, it, when we're looking at the macro environment at this point in time, there's a lot of talk about a potential recession in the U.S. I mean, what, what do you think that then is doing for the industry as a whole? Does that benefit crypto and blockchain? You know, crypto is a risk asset. Yeah. And so if you look at crypto on a sort of multi-year basis, it's not very correlated to equities. Mm -hmm. If you look at crypto on a week-by-week -week basis, it is pretty cor cor uh, correlated to equities. So it kind of depends on, you know, are you, are you investing for one week or are you investing for two years? Uh, but I think on a short horizon, yeah. you know, a U.S. default or a U.S. recession are probably bad for crypto. Why? Uh, because they're a risk asset uh, and people want to take risk off. I think on a long horizon, they're probably good for crypto. Mm -hmm. So one of the strongest price moves that we've seen this year was when U.S. banks started failing. Um, and I think if the U.S. government defaults, we'll probably see a quick pullback mm -hmm. and then a, a very strong push upward in the crypto market. What are you anticipating then? I mean, how closely are you paying attention to it? I think there's probably at least 30 to 100 people in this room alone that are better at predicting whether the U.S. will default than I am. Uh, so I don't, I don't really know. But I think there's probably never been as high a chance that they won't figure out how to raise the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. But that's really just based on my sort of view of U.S. politics, which is that it's incredibly 
entrenched now and very hard to get anything done. Mm. And, and certainly that's been the case in, you know, when they've tried to, to pass any kind of crypto regulations. How, and I'm glad you brought up regulations because that's really been a lot of the talk too in 2023 in the US and, and also more broadly. When you're operating and when you're thinking about expanding, how are you navigating the different regulatory environments and the conversations that, that regulators are having at this point in time? I saw somebody describe the US's environment right now as, as hostile. I mean, I wonder, Europe, UAE, what, what are you seeing? Well, um, so we've been engaged with regulators for eight years now, mm -hmm. and we've seen it sort of ebb and flow. We've seen the U.S. in that time period be very pro-crypto. We've seen, you know, all sorts of things over the last eight years. And what I will say is there's always a lot more noise than signal in all of this. Mm -hmm. The long-term trend has been pretty good for crypto. So in the U.S.? Globally. Okay. So we've gotten closer and closer to regulatory certainty. Crypto in the U.S. has now become a bit of a political issue because uh, there's a few folks in the Democratic Party who have certain views about it. Uh, and then I think even within the U.S., you know, you have the SEC, which is probably what they're referring to as being hostile. Then you have state regulators that are very collaborative. You have the CFTC that's very collaborative. Treasury is actually a very collaborative regulator. Hmm. So the U.S. is very nuanced and complicated Re, you know, regulatory environment for financial services companies. Hmm. Because unlike, for example, Singapore, where there is one regulator, MAS, they regulate everything. Mm -hmm. In the US, you have you know, literally 57 regulators. There's 57 regulators in the US mm -hmm. to regulate financial markets. Mm -hmm. And so it's really impossible to characterize whether they're hostile or friendly or productive because you almost have to rate every single one of them. Mm -hmm. So then, how have your operations been then in Singapore? Yeah, Singapore has been really good for us. We run our regulated uh, institutional business out of Singapore, which is regulated by Mass. Um, you know, the Asian market is really key in crypto. Uh, it's not a big market for us on the consumer side, but it's a big market for us on the institutional side. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of really fantastic talent in Singapore. Mm -hmm both in terms of crypto experience as well as in terms of TradFi experience. Mm. Uh, and so it's become, you know, one of our three largest offices and a really key part of our global operation. What about here in the UAE? Um, we do not have people in Doha. We do have people in Dubai. Uh, but it is comparatively a much smaller presence. Do you see that growing, though? I think it depends on how the regulation shape. Okay. So right now, the government is in a very healthy, consultative process mm -hmm. with the industry about regulations. Mm -hmm. What should they look like? What do they want people to do out of Dubai? So on and so forth. I think so long as those end up where we think they will, we'll probably be investing heavily in Dubai and you know, the Which is UN. where? Where do you think they'll, they'll be? So at blockchain.com now, I'm not the licensing and regulatory expert. Yeah. I just get the broad level summaries. <laughs> uh, and, but I, I think essentially what we usually care about is, are these rules going to keep the customers safe mm -hmm. while still allowing the customer to do what they want to do? Because when you restrict the customer too much, what they do is they go, they go use an offshore platform, mm. right? So now we're disadvantaged because we're complying with the regulation and the customer is sort of like on the equivalent of FTX, which was an offshore platform, mm -hmm. instead of being on a regulated onshore one. And so nobody's being served well by those regulations. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a real sweet spot between regulating enough and regulating too much. Um, and we, we're looking to, to always be in that sweet spot. Well, and how, how do you see mainstream adoption uh, considering all of the different regulatory environments globally. I mean, uh, some people say that there needs to be one international standard. Do you, do you believe that? I mean, how, how do you get more people bought into it, especially considering you're saying this is, we were in a corrective year last year. Uh, how do you get more people on board? You know, it's a tough question because most financial markets are really nationally driven. Like there's a US financial market, there's a British financial market. Crypto was built for the internet, which is, transnational. And so it is really hard to regulate it without a global standard. I think we are seeing that developed, though. 
So right now, one of the most exciting developments in crypto regulatory is that you have the MICA standards in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have one set of standards for all of Europe, yeah. which uh, you know, might not sound exciting, but it's super exciting, uh, which is kind of funny that I'm now super excited about regulatory regimes. <laughs> but the UK is also going to basically be MICA standard. Mm -hmm. So you'll have yet another zone. So for example, if the US was a, you know, to emulate their European counterparts and come up with something similar to MICA, you'd basically now have almost a global regulatory regime. Hmm. So you're getting closer and closer and closer to that, hmm. which I think is really healthy. But you know, it's, it's probably unlikely that they create like the United Nations for crypto regulatory. <laughs> you, um, don't, you don't see that happening. I think that's unlikely. So what we're focused on is how do we make sure that the different major regulatory regimes are cross compatible. Hmm. And how do you anticipate, I mean, you said it's a four-year cycle, right? How do you prepare for what could potentially be the next down cycle or, or, or up cycle? I mean, you said that you think crypto Bitcoin is going to go to 100? So I, I'm, I, uh, I got out of the habit of making price predictions about crypto on stages like seven years ago. Oh, man. So I, I uh, no, no idea. Okay. Uh, but I generally think that the crypto market is going to be much bigger in the future than it is today. What's the future, though? And what will be the catalyst for actually so there, seeing it go up? So crypto operates in this cycle where you have sort of an exponential high year. That was 2021. Yeah. What a year. Uh, then you have a major correction year, which you just witnessed in 2022, which was quite painful. Now we're sort of in a recovery and cont continuation year. Then we'll have another exponential year. So. I never know exactly where we are in the cycle on a week by week basis, but I generally know where we're at sort of on a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. So I, I generally expect the market to be positive uh, for the next you know, 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. What I will say is, you know, as a crypto company, it's actually quite challenging. You know, there's not a lot of crypto companies that make it to their fifth birthday. There's very <laughs> few that have made it to their 10th birthday. There's actually only three that made it to their 10th birthday. And there were hundreds you know, that started 10 years ago. Mm. So the death rate's like 99 out of 100. Does that spook you? Still here. <laughs> uh, I think that the key is thinking a lot about your cost basis, because you are going to have these amazing years, and you're going to have lean years. Mm. You know? And so you almost need to take inspiration from like a commodities business, mm. like an oil company or something that's yeah. dealing with a lot of revenue volatility. And then I think the second thing is what I tell people who are going to be involved in crypto is that you need to figure out a way to manage your own emotions around it in the sense that in the big up year, it's not as good as you think it is. Hmm. Everyone always gets too excited. They think it's going to continue like this forever. They take up their cost basis on their life, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. The good times are not as good as you think, hmm. but on the flip side, the bad times are also not as bad as you think. Hmm. And the key is to somehow, you know, treat, treat it as like a 365 day moving average. Hmm. Take out some of that volatility to the bottom, some of the volatility to the top, and just keep steadily building over a very long period. That's easier said than done, I think, for a lot of people. <laughs> so uh, then what would concern you then? Because it, it seems like, as you were just mentioning, you, you, you seem pretty steady despite all of the volatility that we have seen. What would then cause you to maybe be concerned about the trajectory that the industry is headed in? Well, you know, I have a unique advantage. This fall will be the 10-year anniversary of me being a crypto CEO full-time, which means I have no nerve endings left in my body. Oh. You know, they've all been blown out. Um, but... To answer your question seriously, and something I was sharing backstage is, I would be really worried if there were less developers contributing to open source mm -hmm. crypto projects today than there were three years ago. Um, every cycle, we've seen a slight decline in the number of developers contributing. It's something that we track. This is the first cycle where there's actually a growth in the developer community, mm -hmm. even in 2022, yeah. which is really shocking to me. And the reason this matters so much is, going back to what I said at the beginning of this, crypto is very small today. So if we want it to be really big in the future, a lot needs to be built between now and then. Mm. And if there's no one working on that, our expected value in the future isn't going to be that high. Mm -hmm. 
And so for me, one of the most encouraging things in the crypto market today is that real growth in the developer community. Mm -hmm. And something that would really worry me is if you know I ran those numbers in six months and we were down 50%. Mm. I'd be extremely concerned. Mm. Um, but you know, not yet. What gets in the way of that? I think that when countries like the US mm -hmm. are very, have some regulators that are very openly negative about crypto, it's gonna discourage people from building in crypto. So if enough regulators around the world spoke that way about cryptocurrency and the technology, I think that would probably dampen developer enthusiasm mm. in a way that would na be negative for the space. But that could potentially open up opportunities, right? For, for other countries and other environments. And it, it well. has opened up opportunities for other countries. So, you know, France, uh, Portugal, UAE, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong have all, and London increasingly, interestingly, have all been very, um, very excited to take up the slack that the U.S. has sort of created. Hmm. Uh, very pro-crypto, very, very constructive with the folks that they want to regulate. And they've taken, you know, a huge amount of talent. Like, there's been thousands of incredibly talented people that have left the U.S. and moved to these other jurisdictions over the last year. So for you and your company, are you really leaning into then your offshore operations, uh, offshore from the U.S., considering that? So we don't have any offshore operations. We only have onshore regulated operations, mm -hmm. but we have them in multiple countries around yeah. the world. So no, we're investing heavily in Singapore. We're investing heavily in Europe because mm -hmm. those are the two most certain environments that we have. Mm -hmm. And that is coming at the expense of investing in America. Hmm. How much are you investing and uh, how much do you see that uh, increasing by the end of the year? The vast majority of our resources and CapEx investments are now outside the US. Wow. And, and your prediction for the end of the year? That will, I would expect that to remain true. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Peter Smith, thank you so much for your thank time. You so Thanks, much. everybody. <laughs>
Tell us how this is better for the environment. I mean, it's widely accepted that a plant-based burger, for example, in the process of making that, that it emits, uh, generates about 90% less greenhouse emissions. How is chicken that you cultivate better for the environment? Yeah, it's pretty similar. It really starts with just understanding how um, degrading the conventional process of producing animals is to the environment. So producing, um, slaughtering animals and making meat is responsible for more carbon emissions and all the transportation sources combined, right? So when we think about solving issues like climate change, if we only focus on moving to a renewable or a less carbon emitting infrastructure and we forget about food, we're missing a big piece of the puzzle. Uh, so it's similar in that it uses 80% less land, water, carbon emissions in, in some studies. At the end of the day, though, we're going to require, another company is going to be required to actually build the infrastructure, mm -hmm. measure that at scale to really determine what the, what the relative difference is. Um, but, you know, at the heart of why we do what we do, people love meat. It doesn't seem like people are going to eat a lot less of it. Mm. So how the heck do you figure out a way to allow them to eat meat just in a way that's better? And, and our idea is, let's make the real meat, let's just do it from a cell instead of slaughter. Are you driven more by environmental concerns, this is better for our planet, or ethical concerns? You're making meat yeah. without killing animals. I'll talk about me first and then, yeah. and then others. So for me, when I get up in the morning, uh, the, the driving principle for me is why cause any harm if you don't need to? Hmm. A lot of times as humans living on this planet, we have to cause a bit of harm to get on with our, our lives. Uh, otherwise, we're, we just wouldn't be here. Um, but I think we need to try to call, cause as least harm as we possibly can. And that includes harming an animal, and that includes tearing down a rainforest, uh, and that includes um, feeding the animals we eat more food than we feed to the billion people that are going to bed hungry every night. So that, that's my motivator. I would say the primary motivator, it seems, globally today is actually food security. Yeah. So Singapore is the first place in the world to allow the sale of this new way of making meat. And we're the only company in the world that's ever received approval. We're the only company in the world that's ever sold. Uh, we sell today out of a single butcher shop, pretty small volumes, but nonetheless we're selling. Um, and Singapore has this, this initiative, 30 by 30, where they want to get 30% of their food produced domestically by the end of the decade. And they look at making meat in this way as a key part of that. Um, and we're seeing that from a lot of countries around the world. So food security, more than ethics, seems to be the driving force, and um, we'll go with it. Now, to really make a dent, when we're talking about the environment, climate change, to really make a dent, you need scale. At the moment, you're selling once a week through a butcher in Singapore. That, that's tiny. How do you hope to achieve scale? Well, number one is you need approvals. At the moment, you're only approved to sell in Singapore. Where do things stand in the US? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about some of, the, some of the challenges in actually making this available to, to billions of people. Um, so we received regulatory approval in Singapore in late 2020, and we've mm -hmm. been selling in very, emphasis on very small volumes Yeah. Uh, ever since, less than 5,000 pounds sold uh, since we started. So it's at one part historic that we're actually selling it, and at the other part, kind of embarrassing because we're not selling a whole lot. And very quickly, what's the price of cultivated chicken in Singapore compared to normal chicken? So we sell it, we, we sell it at the same price uh, as whatever chicken is sold at the establishments. We sold at restaurants, hawker stands. Okay. We lose money on every sale, uh, so the cost is much higher, but we, we price it at the, the price of chicken. So we received approval in Singapore. We received FDA approval in the United States. We're only one or two companies that received approval. And now we're working with the USDA to receive final certification before we actually launch in the US with a, an acclaimed chef named Jose Andres. Oh, yes. But to move from, all right, we're selling a little bit, to how does this become the majority of the meat that people consume around the world, a few big things need to happen. First thing that needs to happen is that the cost of the feed that needs to come way down. So in the same way that for chicken or beef or lamb, roughly 50% of the cost structure comes from the soy and corn the animal consumes, pretty similar when it comes mm -hmm. to cultivating meat. We're in the dollars a liter today. Ultimately, we need to get to the tens of cents a liter to be competitive. Second thing is uh, a measure called cell density. And basically what it means is the higher the cell density, the more you can make in a given period of time. So we need to get our cell densities up. And the third and the probably the most important and the most capital intensive is making it in much larger vessels. 
So today we make it in a vessel that um, is about, uh, probably comes up to the, the word future there, a little bit, little bit smaller there. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, we'll need to make it in vessels that are 100,000 liters, 250,000 liters large, that are about as high as the ceiling. That's a lot of engineering, that's a lot of uh, capital, um, and ultimately it's a big opportunity for places like Qatar. That's also going to take a lot of power though, so to really be environmentally friendly, you'll probably need to power that in uh, an eco-friendly way, otherwise we'll need, you're not going to be environmentally friendly. Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly need to use, whether it's natural gas, or renewable sources to do it, but it really does allow countries that might not have the land and the resources mm-hmm. to have a large infrastructure to produce animals, like where we are today like Singapore, um, it allows them to really jump ahead and leapfrog with this technology, um, and, and we want to we wanna see that happen in our lifetime. This is fascinating, and I want to remind you all that we are happy to take questions. So if you do have any questions, please get your phones out and submit them, and I'll try to get to as many of them as, as I can. I would, I would imagine one of the questions, just to, to jump out of it, is does this taste like chicken? I was going to end with that and, and say, it, <laughs> what does it taste yeah, like? Yeah, it, it definitely tastes like chicken because it is chicken. And this is the key point of why this is different than maybe, uh, you know, tofu or a uh, plant-based, plant-based product. Yeah. Cultivating meat is real meat. It's just made in a different way. And if you think about how we produce beef today or how we produce chicken today, it's done in a much more efficient, dense, high technology way than it was done 80 years ago. And we look at cultivating meat as just an evolution of that, right? We're able to make ultimately in the future billions of pounds of meat in a much more efficient way uh, without all the issues. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you're sitting down with your friend and having a chicken dish, mm. it's chicken. Mm-hmm. It's not trying to be chicken. Now, some enthusiasm for these alternative meat alternatives has come off, whether it's uh, with consumers or even with investors. Do you think this could just be a fad, or do you think we are at the start of a really big seismic change in the way we think about meat alternatives? Yeah. I think when you step back, you know, out of the, the daily headlines and the, um, the, the, the daily opinion pieces, and you just look at some of the facts, we have uh, eight plus billion people on the planet today, more people are eating meat today than they were yesterday. We use a third of our planet, I'm going to say it again, a third of the planet Mm -hmm. is dedicated to planting soy and corn just to feed the animals we eat. Not me and you, just the animals animals. we eat, a third of it. And that's only going to grow. More emissions are caused by all the animals we eat than all the transportation sources combined. Big food security issues associated with here. How do we solve it, right? We could solve it by asking people to eat more beans, Mm. which I highly encourage everyone in the audience to eat more beans. We could encourage everyone to eat a lot less meat, which I highly encourage, or we could do something that I think is a bit more practical, which is let's figure out a way to make real meat in a way that's better. And I think at the end of the day, that question has to be answered. Uh, And whether it's by what we do today or by a new technology that, uh, you know, ChatGBT10 comes up with years from now. It just has to be solved. We can't, we can't ignore it. Food is central to who we are, what we do, how we live, um, and meat, it's the, meat is at the heart of that. We've got to solve it. This year, we're seeing rising food prices. We're seeing commodity prices remain high. Millions of people are going to be pushed further into food insecurity. Is there a role for your technology? Um, can your technology help solve the problem of food insecurity? So I would take two elements of food security. So one is food security as it relates to a place like uh, Qatar, Mm -hmm. Singapore, importing well over 90% of its meat, and there's a role right now. Uh, Places like Qatar can build a new meat infrastructure to fulfill fulfill domestic demand and then export today. We don't need to wait for that. The second is food security as it relates to folks that are living under $3 a day, people that are dying of hunger, who are dying of malnutrition. That's a longer term. Uh, process. Ultimately, we need the cost of chicken, beef, lamb, etc., made through cultivating to get significantly below the cost of conventional meat. Now, if we can do that, that's a longer term objective. We think ultimately it can help people that you know, might not be getting enough of uh, high quality protein sources today. 
I was surprised to read that China is uh, supporting um, cultivated meat, and its Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs in January this year released a five-year plan. In, for the first time, it included cultivated meat and future foods as part of its blueprint for food security. That really surprised me. Do you have your eyes on China now? For sure, yeah. We have a, a, a partnership with Alibaba, who's an investor, and a partnership ultimately to go to market uh, with Alibaba in China once cultivated meat uh, get, gets approved there. So on one hand, it's surprising. On the other hand, if you think about it from the perspective of someone in government in China, um, it makes a lot of sense. Because China right now, over the last years, has been buying up farmland in South America, in the United States, in Sub-Saharan Africa, explicitly to plant soy and corn on that farmland to feed animals that are, that are housed in big warehouses in China. And it's an example of if you just step back from the habit of today and you just ask yourself, what's the most efficient way to feed the world meat? And you sort of get out of what we do today. I think most thoughtful people would say, well, you wouldn't have billions of animals. You wouldn't need to buy farmland all around the world. You wouldn't need to use a third of the world to plant soy and corn. Mm. You'd cultivate it. Um, right. And I think China's seeing that. And uh, I think the countries that end up not only seeing it, but actually going for it and building the infrastructure are going to add a big boost of innovation and job growth and uh, competitiveness in the future. So I, I, hope, uh, I hope more get at it. We have a great question from the audience. You've spoken about the benefits of cultivated meat. Are there any health risks? The, the health risks for cultivated meat are pretty similar to the health risks of conventional meat. Because it's grown the same way from an animal cell. So cultivated chicken, which we sell today, has cholesterol. Cultivated chicken has saturated fat, and cholesterol and saturated fat are correlated with heart disease. Now, in the future, what we would like to do is to make meat that's actually healthier from our cholesterol and saturated fat perspective. Um, other safety benefits, though, of cultivated meat are there's little to no risk of zoonotic disease like avian flu, um, microbiological uh, elements like salmonella, uh, E. coli, uh, fecal contamination are absent or at levels mm -hmm. that are not relevant. Um, but we're in the very early days of doing this. Um, as a, today, we're the only company that's selling, um, and we're only selling once a week to about 20 people. Right, So right. long way to go. Would you be willing to provide help and infrastructure or assistance to poverty-stricken countries? In the future, yeah. I mean, right now we're allocating all the capital to make this happen. To make it, yeah, to, to make <laughs> to, it, to make to, it happen. To develop it. Uh, yeah. But but ultimately, I, I spent time in Liberia, and Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria at different points in my life. Um, and when I was staying in Liberia, there was a group of security guards that were outside the building I was working in, and they only had meat once a month. Hmm. And it was the day they got paid. Right. So ultimately, we would like to build a meat infrastructure that radically lowers the cost of meat for people, makes meat healthier, not only benefits countries like Qatar and the United States, but it also is benefiting some of the poorest countries around the world, too. What, another question from the audience. What form does this meat come hmm. in? And it reminds me of, you know, when people say, if it doesn't bleed, it ain't meat. Yeah. So, <laughs> You yeah. Know, what, what does this look like? Like, what form does it come in? Yeah. So about about a trillion dollars worth of meat are produced every year, um, and about half that meat is ground beef, um, minced chicken, and the other half is what you think of whole cuts. So a whole steak, um, you know, a whole piece of fish. Mm. So today, this cultivated meat comes more in the minced form, so more in the ground up form. Um, and uh, as we continue to develop technology in the future, we'll structure it to steaks. It'll have much more structure, much more fat, much more interconnected tissue. Uh, but the very first product that we sold in Singapore is about the simplest meat product you can make, a chicken nugget. Oh, so it right. didn't get any simpler than that. So we start right. with the chicken nugget. Now we've moved to a chicken strip. Uh, we're working on a chicken breast, and we'll, we'll keep advancing it. We've talked in every single panel at this forum about AI in some way or the other. Tell me something, what role do you see AI playing in solving food security? Mm. Yeah, I think in the future, pretty significant. You know, there are a lot of, whether it's the design and the engineer of the vessels that we make the meat in, whether it's optimizing the kinds of components that are a part of the feed, you're dealing with a lot of data. 
right? And to the extent that machine learning techniques and AI can help us more effectively sort through data to make smarter, quicker decisions, it's gonna be relevant. Um, we've used it to, to some extent uh, earlier in the company's lives, and, and I'll bet we'll use it in the future. Three of the co-founders of DeepMind, uh, mm -hmm. the company that was acquired by Google that is one of the leading AI companies in the world are actually investors in the company. Um, and uh, I, think it'll, I think it'll play a pretty important role. But you know, investor enthusiasm for protein-based, I mean, for cultivated meat has come off in the last two years. Are you at all worried about uh, investment drying up? I would think of, when you think of alternatives to meat, there are these different categories. So one is plant-based. Yes. Uh, the other is fermentation, and the other is cultivated meat. Um, and um, I think um, you gotta look at sort of investor appetite for three of them individually as opposed to collectively, that, okay. that's one. But second is, um, no offense to any investors in this room, but whether, whether investor appetite is high for it in 2023 or 24 or you know, back again in 25, this has to be solved. Unless you think people are gonna move to beans, unless you think a lot of people, including all the folks in this room, are gonna eat a lot less meat, we have to solve this because we don't have a planet that can support the way that we currently make meat. So my, um, my optimism for capital is at the end of the day, we need to make things that work for the planet that consumers are gonna want. Uh, and ultimately, I think those kinds of things are gonna provide the kind of return that investors want. So I think, uh, I think it's a good place to invest. We're out of time. We could have gone on and on. We're out of time. Thank you for joining us. But there was one point raised by the audience and yeah. there was a suggestion Try making Wagyu beef, please. That would be a game changer. Well, you know, you know, before, before last thing I'll say is we're, we're partnering actually with a company called Toriyama in Japan who makes a very high-end kind of Wagyu. They say it's very high in oleic acid. <laughs> so, so there you go. <laughs> and uh, that'll, that'll, uh, that'll, that'll come be out. a game changer. That'll come out soon. Great. Josh, thanks very much for Thank being you. here. Pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you like to see what $20 billion buys you in the French countryside? That, over there. It doesn't look like very much from here, but they've been building it for 15 years. And as you can tell by the cranes, they've still got quite a long way to go. There is a running joke that fusion is 30 years away, no matter how far forward in time you go. This is the one big thing that everyone says is the solution to climate change, to, to all of our energy problems. And it would be nice to see if that really is a glimmer of hope on the horizon that we can look forward to. Oh my Lord. It's very futuristic, isn't it? Hey. Anna. Serena, how Finally, you doing? so pleased to meet you. Hey. I'm looking forward to this tour. Yes? Uh, I mean, it's pretty extraordinary already. So this is what we call the assembly hall. Yeah? This is where the machine is taking shape. To see it actually coming together, to see it happening now, this is, this is really um, freaking us out, you know. There is one of our 18 toroidal field magnets. It is the strongest magnet ever built. It has the capacity to lift two aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers? Aircraft carriers. The energy stored in this beast we are really challenging Mother Nature here. Nobody has been there before. Uh, it's like Mars exploration. We sometimes fail, you know, we have to do it again and so on. But this is science. This is the key to research, the essence of research. And then there comes the moment where you succeed. And now my voice is tipping over. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage Leiti Tutwe, Vice Chairwoman of Viet Group and CEO of VinFast, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin.
we're talking electric vehicles, EVs have a huge part to play in the world getting to net zero. The problem is, the IEA says EVs require six times more minerals than conventional cars. So how do you balance environmental goals and transportation goals? Let's get perspective. Tui, good to have you with us. Uh, for those of you not in the loop, you should be. VinFast, of course, has been in, EV, uh, in the EV space for about three years now. It's come a long way since it first started, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, give us a sense of how VinFast looks at sustainability as it develops EVs. Well, we, um, we, we started our, uh, we actually started five, five years ago, over five years ago. I stand corrected. Uh, no, 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 uh, but with, in EV, only, only three years. Um, uh, we started uh, wanting to make EVs, but there was um, uh, no way to learn how to make EVs. So we started with internal combustion engine vehicles to, to learn how to make uh, vehicles. And then we moved on to EVs three years ago. Uh, last year, early last year, we announced that we would uh, stop making internal combustion engine vehicles and we stopped uh, in the summer last year. So now we only, uh, we manufacture, we design and manufacture only EVs. Um, so since the beginning, we had um, we always um, had this ESG at, um, at at the heart. The company we committed to uh, COP26 um, zero emission goals. We uh, we signed the uh, Amazon uh, uh, climate pledge and and all that to uh, reach to the um, uh, zero emission uh, in the future. Um, I think um, you're right that this. Uh, um, it takes more mineral to uh, to make um, battery for the EVs. However, we all know that um, internal combustion engine vehicles is not the way to go anymore. So we need to to move forward. And the and in the future, future at least in the med medium term, uh, all we have is EVs. Uh, we start out with um, no tail tailpipe emission, so that that's a good start compared to internal combustion engine vehicles. We need to uh, to improve and optimize on the you know in the back end uh, with the battery, so that we uh, uh, we consume less uh, critical minerals. But I think there's a lot uh, with the technolo te technological uh, breakthroughs. There are a lot coming uh, as well with the battery recycling, with better uh, battery uh, R&D technology. So I think there's a lot coming. Uh, so what kind of improvement are we looking at with the new technology? I mean, right now, I think it's good enough. If we're going 100, 300 kilometers. Are we looking at 500, 800 kilometers? And one, when might that be? Uh, definitely. I think um, the vehicles today can... Uh, Go comfortably at you know three four hundred three five hundred uh, kilometers. Uh, we, I think eight hundred to a thousand uh, kilometer range is um, in in very near future in the next two three years. I mean depending on the the cost and you know, all, but it's uh, the it's, it's it's possible. It's it, it is about cost. It is about size. It is about a, a lot of different things. What are key considerations? Where are we in those discussions? I think with the uh, battery. Technology. The, um, as the battery technology advances, we get you know we improve the energy density, improve the performance of the battery, um, uh, shorter charging, uh, uh, and uh, uh, just um, longer range for the uh, for the car as well. And then we also uh, there has been a lot of uh, improvement on the charging stations, uh, charging technology for for the vehicles as well. There's a lot of talk about how. We should be targeting towards a circular economy means batteries need to be recycled. We're such at a nascent stage. What needs to be done? What kind of backing needs to be given by governments, for instance, even in terms of incentives? Yeah, I think um, circular economy is very similar to uh, uh, sustainable supply chain to some extent. We need, uh, you need uh, participa uh, participation from all the um, participants in uh, in circular economy, um, I think the um, in battery uh, recycling, we um, I, I mean the, the way we look at the uh, the, the EVs is uh, uh, our battery. We we use the ba battery for the second life of the uh, the vehicle. So we have VNES part of Vin Group uh, that focuses on uh, battery storage system. Um, you know, using battery for other other um, purposes like uh, energy uh, storage, for example. 
And then uh, we look beyond that to the battery uh, recycling. So we, we have been partnering with, um, uh, with other uh, partners in battery uh, uh, recycling. Uh, one of our partners, um, I think Recycle, is, uh, they claim that they can recycle up to 95% of the critical minerals uh, and can release less uh, mineral into the environment, so, which is very encouraging. So uh, bat battery recycling is still in the very nascent stage of development. For, uh, but uh, I think there's a lot of uh, a promising future. Promising? Are we looking at what time frame? Where perhaps we'll we'll three, get to where we want to be? Three to five years, something. Uh, but I think it's uh, some of it now. Like we have, we we already have some pilot uh, uh, recycling uh, factory in, um, in in Vietnam. We're building some in Vietnam already, and we plan to uh, take that model to other countries as well. So it's um, the te technology is here, but the adoption of technology takes some time as well. And also, the, uh, in terms of battery technology, uh, we have been working with a lot of partners to um, reduce, uh, reduce the reliance on uh, critical minerals like um, lithium, cobalt, nickel. We, um, you know, like using, for example, sodium, which is readily thought, readily available. Um, uh, so that, that would be cheaper and, you know, less... Um, uh, having less uh, negative impacts on the environment. So there's a lot going on in the battery uh, industry. That's a great push for the adoption of EVs right now. But of course, for a lot of consumers and buyers, it is still about cost. And right now in countries like Singapore, where I come from, EVs are really expensive. How do you bring the cost down to make it a viable option for consumers? Um, I just had the conversation with some people yesterday about the cost of cars and EVs, uh, cars in general and EVs in Singapore. And I think there's more uh, to, to that cost than just, you know, EVs being, being um, costly. Uh, however, Point noted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, I think the uh, government play and policy play a very important role in adoption of EVs. You see, you look at some um, North European countries like, you know, Norway, Sweden, um, the policy actually play a, an important role in converting most of the uh, vehicles on the road into, into EVs. Uh, you see that in, in the US as well with the policy. I think in Vietnam in particular, there's a new, new policy where that reduced the, um, we call it special consumption tax in Vietnam from, uh, for EV from 15% down to 3%. 3% versus like 40% you know, special consumption tax that you have to pay for a normal car give us advantage in, you know, pricing our vehicles to be at break even or making a profit so that we can uh, sustain the, um, uh, the business, for example. So that, uh, I think policies are very important. Um, and it's also important for us to uh, continue optimizing costs, uh, bringing down the, um, the production, the bomb cost, um, applying more technology to, to, to bring the cost down to make the vehicles uh, more accessible to the mass market, not just to a few people. I want to touch on the ecosystem because I know that Southeast Asia is trying to build an EV ecosystem. It's not just about Vietnam, which is producing cars. We have Thailand, we have Indonesia, which has the, the minerals for, for EVs, and of course, Singapore pushing through um, the adoption of EVs within the country. How do you see this playing out? I, um, I've been saying since uh, end of last year that ASEAN is, um, uh, is a great place to have an ecosystem for, for EVs. And, we are, VinFast is making um, a conscious effort in pushing for that in, um, in ASEAN. So I um, uh, had a meeting with all the ASEAN uh, ambassador in Vietnam last week on the, on the size of the ASEAN summit. And we had um, a few conversation about it. You know, each of the players within ASEAN can, can have their roles in, in building this ecosystem for EV Indonesia with, you know, with the minerals, with you know, battery investment in the battery industry, for example, we um, we as an ASEAN uh, only EV uh, player, for example, uh, with Malaysia, like you mentioned before, semiconductor business, uh, Singapore leading uh, ASEAN in terms of adopting uh, EVs, not only like electric vehicles, but e bus and other form of. Uh, Green energy for mobility as well. So, I think together we can we can um, push forward um, to make uh, ASEAN as um, you know to build a 
ecosystem for EV in ASEAN. So I'm making a few trip. I'm making a trip to uh, Malaysia in a few days, in 10 days or so, um, to further the conversation. The trip to Indonesia is also in Philippines, also uh, part of the plan for, for this year. I mean, it, it takes time and it takes collaboration, not only with, um, you know, government to government, but also private sector need to play a role. But I, I have strong belief that uh, ASEAN can... Um, can be a good place to um, build a ecosystem. But what are the challenges? I mean, this is a country of 10 nations, all at various stages of development. 11 with, now. Yeah, and different, <laughs> different, different expertise. I mean, what are the challenges facing um, the countries, companies, in trying to build this ecosystem? I think the first uh, uh, challenge for, for, for EV adoption is uh, obviously charging, uh, charging networks, right? If you cannot charge the vehicle. Every, everybody has uh, this range anxiety about EVs, even though you can actually, uh, technically, you can plug in the, your car anywhere, like, you know, plugging in um, your phone to charge, but obviously everybody is very concerned about uh, having the very anxiety and charging normally takes a long time, so you need, like, you know, uh, f fast, fast charging stations to um, um, kind of ease off that, uh, that concern. Uh, so I think charging network is important. Uh, it, um, in, in Vietnam, we built the charging network ourselves. So on the highway, from, on, on the main highway, uh, Vietnam is very long. So on the main highway from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City, you can, um, you can ride uh, using our cars because we have charging uh, station everywhere. Um, within about 50 kilometers radius, there will always be a charging station, a wind fast charging station. Uh, in the city, we have a lot more charging stations. So that, uh, that makes uh, EV adoption uh, a little bit easier. Uh, however, I mean, the capacity of charging stations will also need to, to increase because recently we launched um, a green uh, taxi in Vietnam and then we started, uh, uh, and the green taxi started taking up uh, places in charging stations, so now we have to build more as well. Uh, but uh, it's, but it's, it's, it's very important. And then, um, obviously, um, uh, you know, having vehicles of different um, different types uh, to meet different budget for the customers. That's why we have a whole lineup of uh, six different kinds of vehicles from A segment to E segment because it's not uh, one fit all, right? Different families, different consumers have different needs. So we, we need to have uh, vehicle available for, for customers um, and that costs money as well. Uh, and above all, I think the government policy to promote uh, EVs as well as the, um, all the market participants to uh, push for EV adoption. Truth be told, it's a tough space to be in and I think the media has been quite critical of VinFast. In fact, uh, Bloomberg itself ran a story today about how VinFast has recalled some of its uh, cars in the US. What are some of the difficulties that you're facing? Uh, first of all, I think we, we issue a recall for 999 cars in the U.S. Um, uh, I think last, last week, last, um, early last week. Uh, it's, um, it's actually pretty normal in the in industry to, to make recalls. This time we recall. Elon Musk has done it. Yeah, many, I mean, I, yes. I think if you look at the statistic, right, each of the big uh, OEMs have done it five or six times uh, this year. So this is our first time in the U.S. Uh, and the issue for this time is that the, the screen of the mic might uh, go blank for a few seconds, for example. Uh, when I talked about it to somebody last week, uh, I mean, to the, to, to the um, CEO of the SPAC last week, he was just laughing it off. And so he said he's so-and-so EV have that issue all the time, and he's taking it to the uh, and the very established name. He's like taking it to the um, service center uh, next week, so it's okay. But I, I think it's not okay for us because if it's not good, then we need to recall. But it's just a very quick uh, procedure. Uh, update the software either over the air or update the software at the service center and it would be okay. But um, uh, it's out of the precaution for the consumer. Um, uh, OEM should recall the cars if they feel that you know, there's, um, um, there might be a safety issue. We have not seen any, uh, any issues with the vehicle so far, but um, out of precaution. We, uh, we did. Is, is there a sense how many cars have been recalled, just to get a sense of... Uh... Um, it, uh, uh, the the, uh, the uh, recall impacted uh, 208 cars in total. You've rolled out in the U.S. I think it's your second rollout already. Some critics say that you're not quite, your cars are not quite ready 
for the American market. How do you respond to that? Um, we, I think about two weeks ago, there were a lot of, um, um, there's some, some uh, negative news about um, the cast, I think, uh, but to be fair, and this is after the um, media tour where we invited um, a lot of uh, reporters to come and test drive our cast in the, um, you know, just to, um, um, and, and to write whatever um, that they feel about the cast. So there were about six articles that were not uh, positive about um, the cast, but on top of that, you know, we have like 20, 30 different articles that it either neutral or some of them very positive about the vehicles. So on the positive side, you know, everybody agree that the vehicles are um, stylish on the exterior, right, look beautiful. Uh, it doesn't uh, hurt to look good. <laughs> of course, as, um, uh, you know, like spacious and um, good interior uh, loaded with technology. Some of the reporters couldn't understand all the technology that we put in the car. So, you know, part of the step is we have to take some of the features out so that uh, maybe that they're too new for the market, for example. And um, so just in, in general, I think the tone is very positive and good. Um, uh, I think uh, we, we are a new player. Uh, and um, we, of course, we, there, there, there are issues. And, and we welcome all the constructive uh, comments so that we can, can improve. But uh, I think we immediately, we reacted to it. We you know, took all the articles, put out, analyzed every, all the points that people said, and highlighted that you know, there are um, eight or six different points that we need to work on and we have a timeline by Monday morning. So that, that happened on Saturday morning. By Monday morning, we have a list, you know, here's what we need to do and tam the timeline for improvement. For and the plans for your um, plant in North Carolina uh, in terms of production, what are you looking at next few years? Uh, we, um, we, we are in the black, uh, blackout period for <laughs> filing for, for the spec, so we can't share a lot of things, but it's going to come out soon. Uh, we, uh, but we, we, are, uh, we got the air permit, which is the most important permit uh, to, uh, to start the construction. Uh, we, um, we are st still in the process of preparing the foundation for the, for the plant, and we'll start the construction soon. So everything is uh, uh, going according to the plan. Why is spec? Because initially the plan was to go through um, the general IPO, why change the plan? Um, so uh, as you recall, uh, November last year, we fired the F1 uh, to do the uh, traditional IPO, and we've been uh, updating the F1 uh, with the SEC getting the uh, question and providing the answer. Uh, so we, we are ready to go um, to, to, to do an IPO um, uh, via the traditional But why way. is that? Um, however, the market for the last 18 months the market has been, the cattle market has been very challenging. Uh, it's like almost impossible to get a, uh, you know, a IPO done, especially we, we knew. Um, and, you know, we, we're not um, known in the market yet. And um, I think especially for EV sector, it's been uh, more, even more brutal than the normal market. So, uh, so we decided, I mean, IPO is to raise capital and to be listed in the US, right? So for us, being listed in the US is important. Uh, so we just decouple the two goals. Um, first of all, our, uh, our shareholders, our chairman, uh, Chairman Pham Nhat Vuong and Green Group, um, agreed to give us uh, another $2.5 billion to continue uh, with our plan until, um, you know, for the next 18, uh, 24 months. So that gives us the capital needed. Uh, and then we, uh, via the spec, the DSPAC process, we can uh, get the company listed and wait for the market, for the capital markets to come back. Right. Uh, so we achieve both, both goals, but we just um, um, decouple the two goals. If I've, if I've got my numbers right, you've invested about $9 billion already? Roughly, yeah. Yes. In terms of investments, future investments, what are you looking at as you scale, as you expand? Um, I think we have another uh, $2.5 billion committed by the existing shareholders. Uh, to take the company for the next, uh, um, you know, 18 to 24 months. Uh, I think the, the, market, uh, the market potential is huge for EV, right? We can't go back to internal combustion engine vehicles. There are not many players that have uh, uh, the full suite of EVs, like for all the market at affordable pricing like we do. So we feel like the future is, um, uh, is very bright. Uh, it's all, you know, come down to... Um, you know, having proper financing in order to, uh, to take it forward. So, um, yeah, let's see how it goes. 
accelerating growth. Tui, thank you so much for your time today. Ladies thank and you. gentlemen, thank you. Thank you so much. Please welcome to the stage, Robert Friedland, founder and executive co-chairman of Ivanhoe Mines, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Robert, we're the last act. Amazing. We better be entertaining. <laughs> you have a message, and I'm going to summarize it as this. The green transition to a low-carbon economy that everybody wants will be impossible unless the world wakes up and realizes that it needs more copper, more nickel, more cobalt, more manganese, more lithium, and I could go on. There are several other minerals in the equation. You have, I might say, been pounding the table, and your message is a compelling one. It's a persuasive one, and it's an urgent one. Why isn't the message getting through? Well, everything we do, um, everything we touch, we either mined it or we grew it agriculturally. And our species is trying to green the world economy by reducing the consumption of coal and hydrocarbon in the way we generate electrical energy, transmit electro electrical energy, and actually utilize it in an object like a microwave oven or a washing machine or your electric car. As a species, we have to find a way to mine more copper in the next 20 to 25 years than we've mined throughout human history in a period when most of the great copper mines have already been mined and are depleted. If we picture the periodic table behind us, copper conducts electrical energy, making these lights better than any other metal than gold and silver, which are too expensive for the purpose. So the electrification of the world economy requires our species to reinvent mining, go to new places, and it completely changed the way we relate to local communities to make mining a sustainable enterprise. So as I say, it all makes sense. Why isn't the message getting through? In New York, people think a ham sandwich uh, comes from a refrigerator. They never picture 40,000 pigs per day being slaughtered in a river of blood outside Chicago. So we are divorced from the supply chain. People flew here in airplanes or drove here in cars. If you're guilty of going to a hospital or riding a bicycle, you need metal. And the problem is that the real story of how the supply chain works is not well told. Bill Gates' favorite book is How the World Really Works by Rockliffe Smill. When you read that book, you start to understand how critically important natural gas is to the world economy. You know a little bit about how I and others think, and it would seem to me that if this were as much of a problem as you want us to believe it is, we would see it reflected in the prices of copper, of cobalt, of nickel, of manganese, of lithium, and these other minerals. And the truth of the matter is that while copper has had a good run, it's on its way down. And none of those other metals, at least to the best of my ability, to identify the prices are trading anywhere near records. Mm. What's wrong? The only thing we know for sure about metals prices is that they will fluctuate. Uh, uh, with mining, we have to have a very long-term horizon. It takes 10 or 15 years to discover a large mine. It takes another five or 10 years to build it. And then they run for a century. Mm -hmm. So we just can't be um, disturbed by the vagaries and the fashions of trends in financial markets, and that's part of the dilemma. We need patient, long-term capital. Look at the development of the North Field here in Qatar. Amazing, and so essential to keeping Europe warm at night. It takes decades to develop this kind of fundamental, basic resource. And without it, we're really gonna face an enormous challenge as a species in the next 10, 20, 30 years. I'll go back to markets for a second. Markets, financial markets, are clearing houses for information, and they are supposed to reflect 
something akin to the wisdom mm. of the crowd. Mm. The crowd doesn't see Pete Copper. All the, all the crowd sees right now is that the Democrats and the Republicans can't agree on how much more American money to print. The markets have a very, very short-term view. In most of life, we worry about what we're going to eat for lunch or where we're going to sleep tonight or tomorrow. It's a very small fraction of humanity that has the ability to look long-term and deal with basic human issues. So it's easy to criticize the state of the world or to get mesmerized by the markets. But what we're talking about is the critical role Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar are playing in basic energy provision. Without that basic energy, we're not going to be able to make any form of energy transition. So if the financial markets and Wall Street rich large, writ large, excuse me, doesn't get the picture, who does? Who gets the picture? Who, who understands the message you're trying to deliver? I, I recently met a very high-ranking Royal Highness in this part of the world, and I said, Your Highness, why do you buy the mining industry as a hedge? You're along all this hydrocarbon. He said, it's a great idea. How can we do it? Um, if you, if, I think everyone in Be this region... Be careful about the ideas you uh, put in people's heads. I think, I think in this region, um, everybody knows that hydrocarbon is a gift from the creator. Uh, they know that wealth came out of the earth as a gift from the creator. Metals are the same. The whole world economy depends on a stable transition to a cleaner way to generate energy. But even hydrocarbon requires metals. If you look at the energy intensity mm -hmm. of developing the North Field and expanding it to keep Europe warm in the dark, it's absolutely critical that Aramco and the other major energy providers like Qatar can maintain stability. I always try to say that I've interviewed 55 billionaires recently to check if any of them put their pants on both legs at a time jumping into their pants. I haven't found one that can do that yet. They all admit that they put on one leg, stand on that leg, and put on the other leg. We can't get to a new world in energy without depending on hydrocarbon or nuclear power. It feels to me like, at the very least, Elon Musk understands some of what you're saying. He has been drawing attention to the shortage of lithium, specifically refined lithium. Mm -hmm. Is he wrong to be focusing on lithium alone? Well, you know, he was the, he, you know, he gave the traditional automakers a hot foot and stimulated the change to the whole industry making electric cars. And people are quite focused on the cars without thinking about where the electrical energy is going to come from. If everybody in America plugs in a car at 5 p.m., the whole electrical grid is going to die. The whole grid has to be upgraded with oceans of copper to enable that to happen. Uh, a great visionary industrialist like Eon, Leon, he's not, he's not to be criticized, he, but the whole issue has to be looked at womb to tomb, cradle to grave, sperm to germ. How are you going to revolutionize the whole energy system? We need the incumbents in clean energy like LNG to even have a hope of putting on the other pad leg and developing the metals we need. Robert, I want you to help me and everyone else here take a look at this issue we're discussing through a geopolitical lens. Um, I recently read a story in the New York Times, and full credit to the New York Times, you should go and look this up. It's about how much of the electric vehicle supply chain is controlled by China. 95% of manganese refining 73% of cobalt refining, 70% of graphite refining, 67% of lithium refining, 63% of nickel refining. Why isn't this being treated as a national security issue in Washington? One of the problems with the uh, concept of an energy transition in general, which requires all of these metals, is that we now have a balkanization of the world supply chain. Uh, we have distrust of China and Western societies, and now we have war, and war also uses the same metals that we need for an energy transition. Don't blame the Chinese for being good planners. 20 or 30 years ago, they thought we have 1.3 billion people. If everybody gets a hydrocarbon engine for their car, we're gonna burn all the oil in the world. So they, they developed the world's largest 
solar industry, the world's largest wind industry, world leaders in electric cars, and using basic human intelligence, they went out and acquired these metals. Now everybody wants these metals for their national security. The Japanese want to build an army. The Germans want to build an army. Uh, Taiwan wants to turn itself into a giant porcupine. This is all metals intensive. And so this has become a national security issue that each nation wants to secure its supply chain right down to the metals and other fundamental tenets in their society. America has a CHIPS Act. Why doesn't America have a Cobalt Act? America has an Inflation Creation Act, which uh, is designed to stimulate um, and make it more reasonable for mining. Mining has been c considered a sin in the United States for decades. The mining industry stayed away in droves. Now the mining industry can only go to certain environments where we're allowed to mine. We can't mine in Russia. We can't mine in Ukraine. We can't mine where it rains or snows more than it evaporates, like the jungles of Brazil. So most responsible mining is done in desert environments. The, the uh, Atacama Desert in Chile, Nevada, the Australian outback. These kinds of environments are in a lot of Islamic countries, and one of our basic messages is the Islamic countries have enormous potential to develop mining industries that are in areas that have heretofore been unexplored. With or without balkanization of supply chains, do people appreciate the inflationary implications of building a parallel energy system around low, par low carbon power? No, they don't. Uh, the, the world integrated economy peaked in around 2008. And ever since then, we're starting to demonize the other and break down the integrated world economy. So the, the issue is supply. We're crushing demand by raising interest rates the minute the Fed stops raising rates and we get past this budget crisis, we go back to building a new world. It's a supply problem that's creating all this inflation. And when we don't cooperate as a species with a just-in-time economy, as we break that down, it's very inflationary and creates a lot of tensions. I have heard you use the term militarization of the supply chain. What do you mean? Well, when we went to Africa, starting 20 or 30 years ago, there was a, a, a Chinese restaurant in every little town. The Chinese were prescient. They were early to go to Africa, realizing that they had to feed their people. They had to get the raw material they needed. Now we're seeing pushback where, where every nation is worried about its basic supply chain. The Japanese and the Koreans have historical animosities. They both want their own supply chain. The Americans want their own supply chain. The Chinese want their own supply chain. Europe is freaking out about events in Ukraine. They want their own supply chain. And this is a very serious issue. And, and we're all in trouble if we don't cool it. We need to really take a deep breath. And NVIDIA just talked about this with chips, for example. We have to take a deep breath and stop this downward spiral between China and the Western world, for example. We really need to remember that we got this far with an integrated world economy. China helped finance, if I'm not mistaken, helped finance your copper mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. One of them. One of them. And they still own part of it, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So, you're right. There's tension in this world. You're an American. Your company is based in Vancouver. You have, at least in one of your copper mines, a Chinese shareholder. What happens if push comes to shove? How do you, how do you choose sides? <laughs> we really need to cooperate as a species. Um, Xi Jinping recently came, the president of China, to meet His Royal Highness Mohammed bin Salman. We have a multipolar world all of a sudden. It's quite destabilizing. Everybody needs to get everybody. Uh, if you put 10 dogs in a room and put a video camera to watch those 10 dogs and leave the room, all 10 dogs smell both ends of every dog. We need to get used to each other. We're all people. And I'm very concerned about the militarization of the supply chain. If we start militarizing it, that can only lead to war. And I think it's time that all good people stand up together and say we need to take a deep breath and stop this downward spiral. The minute Robert, we start you and I can plead for peace until the sun goes down. It might not help. Inshallah, we'll have a peaceful world. And, and uh, this region has a very, very important role to play. 
It's very important to keep the lights on. It's very important to keep the lights on. It's difficult to exaggerate the importance of the Northfield and LNG as one of the most important transition forms of energy, if we're even going to dream about getting to a, a new and better world for our kids and does, our grandkids. Does the militarization of the supply chain mean that we're entering a new commodity super cycle? I don't know about commodity super cycle. I don't know what the word even means. I'm saying that we need a lot of clean energy for seven or eight billion people. Uh, if we didn't have natural gas, half the population in the world would immediately starve because the Haber process wouldn't be able to make fertilizer. I think it is important that we start communicating the message of where things come from in the supply chain and how dependent we all are on each other. If you went to a Walmart store in the United States 10 years ago, 15 years ago, everything said made in China. That was the factory of the world. If we start breaking that down, ladies and gentlemen, things are going to get more expensive. And uh, we really need to take a deep breath and not let politicians drag us into a road to hell. You were in China recently. What do the Chinese have to say about this? The first thing I want to tell you is they're not the Chinese. They're individual human beings, just like all of us in this audience. They can think, they can act, and, and um, we're, we're all in this together. And they, they, you know, they see the world a different way. Uh, China is like a communal society, like a giant hive of bees. They give royal jelly to one bee and make a queen bee. But in the Quran, I'm told it said that the honeybee is the only animal that Allah speaks to directly. So the way they organize their society is very different from American thinking, which is based on, I'm the individual, I'm God, I'm the only guy that's important, I have the right to my gun. So these two different societies think very differently, but we're inhabiting the same little planet hurtling through space. And it's very important that we start to learn from each other rather than objectifying the other and deepening the tensions. Many years ago when I used to cover the copper industry, a geologist told me, we've run out of elephants. We've hunted them all down. Elephants, of course, being giant copper mines. Mm. Uh, because if you look at the cross section of a giant copper mine, it sort of looks like an upside down elephant. Now, a few other elephants have since been discovered, including the one that you found in the DRC. Where are the elephants of the future? Are they on the bottom of the ocean? Are they in the Arctic? Are they in the Antarctic? Where are they? Are they on asteroids? It's going to be a while before we mine asteroids because we have the problem of getting the metal down through the atmosphere without burning it up. We will mine this planet. Um, when you go to the Colorado School of Mines, they have a bumper sticker that says, Earth first. We'll mine the other planets later. But for the foreseeable future, we'll be mining in new places on this planet. Afghanistan is an example of a country with a rich mineral endowment, um, or Baluchistan, where Barak is going to build a copper mine. There are a lot of places in the Islamic world that are yet unexplored for metals. Even in Saudi Arabia, there's a massive mineral endowment waiting to be explored and developed. We just have to go to new places, and we have to look deeper, and we have to develop new technology and new ways to deal with local communities to get there from here. Absent that, we have a really profound problem. The capital markets have been largely shut to mining exploration and development for more than a decade. Why is there no money for mining? Mm. It's the tyranny of the net present value model. The Chinese don't really use a net present value model because they have 1.3 billion people to feed for the next thousand years. So they went out into the world and acquired large elements of the supply chain. They built infrastructure in Africa, they developed the Belt and Road, to get access to the raw material they need to feed their 1.3 billion people. Most societies are not going to have to think more like the Chinese. You're going to have to have long-term thinking for, for basic human needs. And we have to do this in a cooperative way rather than militarizing this. In World War II, the Germans invented the U-boats. And the idea of the U-boats was to interrupt the supply chain from the United States to Europe. Had we not broken their Enigma code, the Germans could have won World War II. So we're seeing a struggle over the supply chain. And those countries that have something of basic human need, like the gas in this country, that LNG, have to play to their strengths and find a green way to provide the metals we need. And the metals underpin food, underpin water, underpin agriculture. And uh, in time, 
uh, God willing, we'll find the capital we need and the intestinal fortitude to get it done. How important is the capital in this room, in this region, to the Green Equation? It's, it's impossible to overemphasize the importance of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar to the security of this planet. Now that we've embargoed Russian hydrocarbons and the easy shale gas and shale oil has been developed in the United States, that's on the way down. Energy security has to be maintained in a very stable way so that we can get to something new. We can't just turn the lights off for humanity. So it's difficult to overemphasize how critical and how important it was that His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz was here. He came to Qatar. He emphasized we're all in one family, and I would extend that family to everybody. We need that stable role of conventional hydrocarbon energy while we engineer a new economy. And it'll take us at least a generation to get there from here. We have indeed seen extraordinarily warm feelings expressed among members of the GCC here on stage at the Qatar Economic Forum, not least, as you point out, between the Qataris and the Saudis. The truth, Robert, is that there are still many deep-seated rivalries among the ruling families in this part of the world. Tell us, what is the secret to doing business with all of them? We can pray. <laughs> Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar. We Ladies and gentlemen, yes. Robert Friedland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll follow you. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And just like that, we've uh, reached the end of the Qatar Economic Forum. We'd like to thank all our sponsors. Please do join us again in 2024.